Greetings, everyone, and um, welcome to this session on um, bookkeeping, financial management, budgeting for SMEs. Um, my name is Gabriel Gomez, and I will be taking you through the session. Uh, I'll be your facilitator through the session. So by the end of this session, we will learn about um, how to estimate costs and how to define revenue streams in your, in your various enterprises. We also learn about budgeting and also um, you know, you know, how to set prices for your products and services. So um, we will learn about how to maintain various books of accounts and um, also understand the value and um, importance of sound financial management in a business or in a company, if you like. So um, Warren Buffett, the chairman and CEO of um, Bucket Share Hathaway, once said that um, you need to understand accounting and you need to understand the nuance of accounting. It is a language of business and it is an imperfect language. So um, for most of us that don't like um, accounting in school or have never sit in an accounting class, I want to encourage us all that um, it's important for every business person, for every entrepreneur to understand the basics of accounting, to understand what you know, transactions can make me, you know, my business profitable. What investment can bring me, you know, better returns? All those things are important. So I will actually, um, you know, um, encourage you to um, follow these sessions very closely and um, also endeavor on your own to try to develop your accounting documents or your accounting skills. So we're starting with cost reduction. Cost reduction is um, you know, a fundamental part of um, you know, business because um, for you to be able to be profitable or for you to be able to uh, you know, be competitive in the market, you need to be able to reduce cost, especially costs that are not very much needed in a business. So um, we'll be going through certain you know, questions so that we'll be able to understand this better. So now as a startup, what cost, or, you know, how can I reduce my um, initial cost? What cost can I um, you know, reduce at an initial stage? Or what cost can I ignore at an initial stage? So um, I'm suggesting to us that um, we may not, most of us may not need an office space. So instead of renting an office space, or instead of renting a hall to do your transactions or for your business, you might as well start from home and actually try to be using common spaces for, um, you know, for entrepreneurs. You know, um, some of you may actually um, have um, you know, space in the market also. Instead of renting a big place that will be able, that, you may, that may cost you more, you may actually try to avoid that. So the other thing that I would also suggest is um, don't rush to employ so many people. You know, try to be subcontracting aspects that you are not an expert in. You know, give it to other people and you pay them for their service of what they have done. If you have, um, you know, somebody that is um, doing, uh, you know, Let's take, for instance, uh, an IT person that can do websites for you. Instead of you know, employing an IT staff that will be there, and most of the time he may not be able to have, you know, he may not be having a lot of work to do. You know, subcontract so this particular job to an, the IT person so that you'll be able to reduce cost. You know, the same thing for you know the graphic design and whatsoever. So instead of um, hiring people like that, you just hire. You know, it just um, subcontract those type of jobs. So how can I find cheaper versions of, you know, um, the same component? So some of us um, that, you know, deal in raw materials, you know, let's take, for instance, um, you know, you are doing uh, mango juice or you're doing, um, you know, um, you know, other processing. So 
we very much know that most of the things are more expensive in uh, in KMC and uh, and Banjo, and uh, so it may be wise if you are buying in huge quantity for you to buy most of these raw materials outside KMC because it's likely going to be cheaper, especially when it comes to raw materials and they may be the quality that you need. So you consider buying in bulk so that you'll be able to have a um, you know, bulk discount. You know, if you buy either from you know, Brickama or buying from Barra or so, so you'll be able to see that most of this may actually be, uh, you know, it may be profitable for you or wiser for you to actually buy you know, them in bulk and um, consider buying them, um, you know, uh, maybe outside Saracunda. Of course, some, some of them may be cheaper here, but you need to compare the cost and you need to also add the transportation component if you are buying them outside Saracunda. So how can I share the initial cost with other people? So you can share the initial cost with other people and um, the initial cost expressed when it comes to buying of um, you know, raw materials. So you may, if you have, if you're in the same line of business with, um, you know, um, a, a partner or a colleague or so, you may actually agree with them to um, buy in bulk and you share the cost. Cost sharing is one of the techniques that um, startup use to, um, you know, to be able to get um, economies of scale. So if you buy in, if you have, you know, in worth of 10 kilos, somebody have worth of 10 kilos, when you put all, you know, all your kilos together, you can buy in bulk and you will um, profit from um, you know, bulk discount. That is um, you know, another thing that you need to consider. So as a startup, what is your business risk? What is your biggest risk? Yes, I'm talking to you. What is your biggest risk? So, um, so many businesses may have similar risk, but their biggest risk may be different. So I just want to um, you know, explain the concept of risk using um, you know, four main risk categories. Of course, um, you have you know, so many risk categories or so many risk factors that every business is faced. We may not have time to explore all of them. I just want to mention some of them so that you'll be able to, um, you know, um, relate it to your business and actually use it um, to, to, um, to, uh, you know, understand, you know, the concept of risk. So, um, economic risk. Economic risk is talking about adverse market conditions. Most of the time, they are not under the control of the entrepreneur. Sometimes they may be influenced by other factors, you know, either political factors or environmental factors or others. But most of the time, is usually the economic environment, which have um, you know, in which you know, you know, political influence may you know have um, uh, you know a way in. So. When there are unfavorable market conditions as an entrepreneur, what do you do? When there is unemployment, and you know that when people are not employed, they don't have much money to be able to buy goods or services, especially non-essential goods. When that happens, what do you do? Also, when there is increase you know, general increase um, in price of goods and services, people may not be able to afford that. So what do you do as an entrepreneur to be able to penetrate and remain relevant in the market? Also, you may have um, inflation, you may have increase in interest rate. And you know, when there's an increase in interest rate, when an entrepreneur take a loan to be able to finance his investment, you know, the cost of the interest rate may be added to the product, which may actually lead to the increase in prices. So you need to consider all these things as an entrepreneur to be able to decide, you know, uh, you know, on you know, various risk aspects and be able to say that this is the most risky aspect of my business and I am willing to do A, B and C to be able to reduce it. So compliance risk. So compliance risk is um, a risk where 
you know, um, an entrepreneur failed to comply with um, the legal requirements of uh, of a state or of um, you know of you know of a go you know of government or so. So when you have compliance, when you are you know you know that is why we always urge entrepreneurs to be very compliant with what you know ever um, standards or whatever rules are there. So those that are into processing. You know that um, you know standards bureau have standards that um, you know you know how clean your your um, your production site should be you know um, you know how you should actually you know put on you know um, protective gears among others you know that will actually you know you know help you avoid contamination. If you fail to do that, you know food safety and quality assurance you know are empowered to enforce that law. Or to enforce that standard, if the food safety came and come and meet that your business premises is dirty, you know you are not, you know you do not follow the various ISOs or you know, you know the various standards. You may actually be fined or be temporarily closed. So it is important for every business person to be compliant, especially those that are into um, you know you know edible food also, because um, that is one aspect that I know very well that um, is enforced in the Gambia here. So if you are into um, you know that area, you need to actually consider that. That could be a risk that may be a major risk for you. So operational risk, operational risks will actually talk about your operations you know what will make you know what will result, what will make your you know your operations to fail you know if you are into um, you know you know if you you know require if your production require energy let's take for instance nawek if nawek fails if there is no nawek there may be no operations for you you know, for those that you know uh, that are into IT, if your business is um, linked to the internet, if if um, you know Gamtel or other you know you know um, ISP providers failed, that means that um, you know you are likely not going to operate. So operational risk is talking about you know a failure in operations, which you know may result from either the people that are working there or the system. You know that is um, you know the system you know that you know system failure, or it may even be your um, suppliers. So if your suppliers fail to supply you, that means that you will fail in operation. So you know you need to consider in you know, operational risks in all these dimensions, in these four dimensions. So you need to talk about think about you know the people. You need to think about um, the the processes. You need to think about the um, the um, the system you need to also think about um, you know the external factors which is predominantly suppliers. So when you think about all these and you look at your operations and see where is the my major risk coming from from the operational side. So you need to actually um, be able to identify that. So competition risk, competition risk is talking about um, the risk of you failing to um, you know grow as a business person because you know all your competitors you know are better established than you so uh, because you know um, you know of competition you may not be able to survive in the market so if you have competition risk what is advice for you to do is you just need to be more innovative Try to um, change the way you know you operating. Try to change the way you are marketing your products, among other things. So competition risk will always be there. Even if you are the only one doing the type of business that you are doing, there may be, may be a substitute product to another to to another 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 you know business person. So you need to actually take this seriously as a business person and be able to um, work towards uh, you know competing favorably. You know, in the market. So um, at this point, I will allow you to um, digest what is discussed.
but then you go to your workbook and uh, you know answer the related questions that are relating to what we just discussed now. So we are going to the next phase. Uh, we are looking at the cost aspect of um, the business. So there are different kind of um, cost for every business, and um, the most common cost is what we have just listed here and categorized you know, into business expenses, into, um, you know, uh, maintenance costs, and also into uh, administrative and physical cost. So you need to understand as a business person that um, this is not exhaustive. You have so many other, you know, um, you know, expenditure lines that may not be included here, that may apply to your business. So in case that you know, you know, some of them are not applicable to you, you may actually um, add the ones that are applicable and ignore the ones that are not. So basically that's important for you to note. And um, so we need to look at you know, um, you know, the cost in these aspects. Ask yourself these questions. Are all these costs necessary? If those ones that are applying, that apply to you, are they necessary? Do I need to rent in an office space? You have office rent there. Do I need, you know, uh, an accounting services? Can I can I do it alone? Do I need fuel, you know, expenses? Do I need a software? So all these things are questions that you need to ask yourself. If they are not necessary, what is advice is you ignore that. You opt out. That is the thing that to do. If they are not necessary for you. You leave, those that are necessary is where you pay attention to. Yeah, that's important. So now how do you reduce this individual cost? So now for each of the individual costs that you think uh, is, is important, but then the cost is high, then you look for various ways of reducing it. And now in reducing cost, you know, you need to look at it internally first. Can I do this job? Can I do it myself instead of taking it outside for somebody to do? You know, if you cannot do it yourself, then you think about, do I have, you know, let's say people that can do it for me, you know, having the same quality, but at a lesser price. You need to actually look at that and consider to how, you know, how to uh, minimize that cost. Yeah, so what kind of tax concessions or allowance can I get? So some of you have um, some tax, you know, and can have, you know, capital allowance. If you have assets, you know, and when you talk about, you know, fixed asset, they can be, um, you know, they can be table, they can be vehicle, they can be whatsoever. So now these fixed assets, you know, there is tax allowance for them. You know, some of them have three years, some of them have four years tax allowance. That means 25% of them can actually be legible expenditures that you can include which can actually have, you know, give, you know, a tax allowance or a capital allowance. That is to say that, you know, your tax will be reduced by that, you know, amount of, um, you know, of, you know, expenditure related to that fixed asset. So can I negotiate prices based on um, required quantities? Yes, we've discussed this earlier. So now, usually, in business, the more quantity that you buy, the more bargaining power that you have for a unit price of the product to be reduced. So let's take, for instance, you need to um, buy, you are doing orange juice and you buy 100 kilos of or oranges from you know, a supplier as opposed to buying 10 kilos. So if 10 kilos will cost $10 per, kilo, 100 kilos will obviously, may obviously cost you $8 per kilo. So you can negotiate prices based on um, the quantities that you are buying. So that is why I actually said earlier that um, it's important for you business, you know, men to actually buy in bulk so that you can get a um, bulk discount for um, your products and services. So we are going to cost estimation, the estimating cost of producing one item. But before then, what is cost? 
So cost is a business expenses resulting from a good or services. Resulting from consumption of goods or services. So when you consume a good or services, it is considered as cost, especially when it comes to, you know, in the business sense of it. So cost can either be variable or fixed. And variable cost means that the cost will be increasing once you increase production. The more units you produce, the more cost. That is variable cost. That is to say, if you have raw materials, the more raw materials will actually result to the more, more production or more units that you are going to produce. More labor will actually you know, you know, require the same. More transportation, either in form of a distance or in form of the number of quantities that you are putting in, because we know that um, you know, transporting 100 kilos will be more expensive than transporting 10 or 15 kilos. So that is what we are saying here. So it is important that um, you, know, you understand that um, you know, variable cost increase in line with the number of units produced, yeah? So fixed cost. Fixed cost always remain the same. And for the most part, it's, it is independent of production. So meaning if you produce 10 kilos, you know, or 50 kilos, the, you know, the, the cost may, it may likely not change. Especially, you know, let's look at rent. If you rent a space, whether you use it or you don't use it, you still pay the same amount. Whether you produce more, you sell more or so, you still pay the same amount. The same thing with salaries. When you hire people to, you know, you know to, um, to um, you know, work for you, whether you know the work rate increased or not, there is likelihood that the salary may not change. You no, know, you know when you you know host your website or so, the price remains the same regardless of you know whether or not you sell more or you produce more. So um, it is important that um, you understand that um, fixed costs remain the same for the most part. Variable costs keep changing. I hope that is clear. Yeah, good. So cost of production. So I just want to itemize some of the production, um, you know, cost of production. So for the retail shop, you may just need to buy goods, transport them, you know, and you know, the person that you're going to put in, I know how much you're going to pay the person that they're going to put in the shop, as well as the shop rental among others. So this cost will add up, you know, to make your, your, your you know, your, your cost. And for you to be able to put your price, you need to be able to determine all these costs and actually, um, you know, you know, divide it by um, the the number of units that you have to be able to know how much you can sell a particular product, you know, particular product for. Processing, you will need raw materials, you will need labor to be able to produce the finished product. You will need transportation and logistics to transport it to, um, you know, where you're going to sell it or where you're going to do the production. The same thing, you know, you also need to package the product, you know, for, for the processing also. So the IT, you just need labor, you need advertisement, you need contracting costs because you may need to contact people. You may need to um, you know, outsource it to um, other people. So that is important for, you know, the IT service. So for poultry, you need, um, you know, feed, you need chicks, you need casual labor, how much you pay them, you need vaccination. You need um, electricity. You also need transportation and logistics. So you will see that for most of them, they have similar, you know, cost items, but some of them are a bit different. So you need to understand that this is my sector that I am operating in, and these are the costs that I need to consider, you know, uh, when I am pricing my products. Yeah. So calculating unit price of a product or service. So calculating the unit price for product or service, what you need to consider is, you need to consider all the cost that is related to the product and divide it by the total number of units, then you know. So raw materials, direct labor, transportation, and so on and so on, you need to add all those costs 
and you know divided by the unit you know number of units that are produced. So let's take for example, if a raw material costs fifteen thousand, direct labor costs twenty thousand, transportation and logistics cost you know one thousand, then the total cost will be thirty six thousand. Yeah, thirty six thousand. So if the entrepreneur have 800 units or produce 800 units, then the unit price of the product, he or she, of he or she, you will get before selling is 36,000 divided by 800. And you will get the cost to be $45 per product. So meaning for each product, it costs you $45. Yeah. So for you to be able to price this product effectively in the market, you need to do add a markup. Markup is adding a particular percentage to the cost of the product. Now, for example, if this is $45, then you add 20% to it. 20% of $45 is $54. So meaning for each product, you are going to get $9 as your profit if you're using 20%. So, so you may also say, no, I may not, I will not use, you know, 20%, I'll use another percentage. But then before you actually agree on which percentage you're going to use, you actually need to also understand you know, what competitors in the market are also offering for the same products and services. Yeah. So ask yourself this question. What is my biggest cost? Is your biggest cost labor? Is your biggest cost raw material? Is your biggest cost, um, you know, packaging? If that is the case, then you need to think of how do I reduce it? without compromising quality, of course. Yeah? So you need to think about how do I reduce, you know, raw materials? That means that you need to look for, you know, other sourcing, you know, other sourcing sites, you know, with the same, you know, without compromising quality. You need, you know, if it is, um, you know, you know, labor, you may actually need to think of how do I outsource it? Or if you are already outsourcing, you may think of how do I bring it inside you know, and we, we are able to produce it from within. So you need to actually consider some of these technicalities and be able to decide on what is the best thing that can be done to be able to have cost under control. Which element can I subcontract if it is cheaper? So can you subcontract, you know, um, the label? Can you subcontract, um, you know, the packaging? So you need to look at which aspect of your business is um, you know it's very high, but then you can actually you know outsource it to someone at a cheaper rate, you know at a cheaper you know and a cheaper uh, amount. So you need to actually consider this as a business person so that you will be able to put your cost under control and maximize your profit. And you also need to consider to as well which of these areas am I very good at? If subcontracting becomes expensive. Which of them can I do myself? If you can do, you know, packaging yourself, that is fine. If you can do the production yourself, that is fine. So you will look at which ones can you do, which becomes that you cannot. That's the one that you consider, you know, uh, subcontracting. So can I buy cheaper goods? Of course, we discussed those earlier. You can buy cheaper goods. You know, depending, you know, but then buying cheaper goods will actually mean that you need to maintain quality. So buying cheaper goods, you need to source from other suppliers that are around. Or if, you, if they are not around, if you're in, if you are in Saracunda, and the may, maybe the cheaper suppliers are in, um, uh, in let's say, Gunjur in, in, in West Coast region, you need to look at, if I add the transportation cost, how much will it, you know, add up to? Does it make sense for me to go to Google to buy this? Or can I actually, you know, just um, use the ones that I currently have in Saracunda here? You need to weigh the two before you take a decision. Can I look for a cheaper supplier? 
Yes, you can look for a cheaper supplier, but you also need to ask a question as to whether or not that supplier will be able to supply with, with you know, con, you know, with um, the relevant quantity that you need and quality, and also whether or not that particular supplier will be consistent in the supply. Those are important questions that you need to ask before you actually take a decision to change or even utilize another supplier. Yeah. So you can go to your workbook and um, try to um, answer the you know questions that you have in there. Yeah. Yeah. That is you know you go and list down the possible you know unpredictable cost. You know we all know that um, you know unpredicted costs are costs that you do not expect. You know, costs that um, are maybe related to, um, you know, maybe when you're doing your business, you pay yourself a salary, but then you may have other family needs or family issues that may come in that you do not actually foresee. So those ones are unpredicted costs. You also have, you know, other costs in the business. Maybe you start the operations and, uh, you, know, in, you know, later in the operations, you notice that, okay, the, you know, you know the, the machine that you are using is faulty. So you need to do you know, maintenance of that machine. Those are all unpredicted costs. So all the unpredicted costs that you have in your business, you need to list all of them down. So and, um, you know, once you list all of them down and you try to cost them. So basically when you um, go to the workbook, you should be able to um, go through it with ease. Yeah. So we have what financing will you need? What financing do you need as a business? Now, you need to be able to understand that um, the summary of your initial expenditures plus your reserve plus your fixed cost for six months or for three months in this case gives you the financing amount or the financial amount you need to start in the beginning. Yeah. So, and this financing amount in that you need to start in the beginning will actually be, you know, the cost that you need to find, the money that you need to find. So you need to ask yourself the question, how do I finance my minimum viable product? The minimum viable product is the product that, you know, you, you know, that um, is, available to the market and you can actually you know um, you know uh, you know do it at a, you know at a minimum you know minimum cost because if it is expensive it doesn't make sense for you to actually take it to the market so how do you finance this minimum viable cost in minimum viable product so you will need to look at it in this way do i have the money myself how much of the money do i have Let's take, for instance, the entire cost for your minimum viable product is 500,000. Then you have 30,000 that you have as your own money. Now, maybe your family and friends wants to help you with 80,000, with, with um, you know, maybe another 50,000. So 50,000 plus 30,000 will give you an 80,000. You understand? So meaning that um, in all what you have is 80,000. So you are remaining with a 20,000. So it's only when you are remaining with that particular amount that is when you can actually start to look for either a grant or a loan. So, um, you know, people that, you know, uh, may be offering grant, you know, you, you know, you can tell them, oh, I have 80,000, but I need 20,000 to be able to finance this product. So basically you need to actually consider that as a business person. So, We are looking at market valuation now. If it costs $100 is to produce a necklace, you add a margin of 20%, the customer will pay an amount of $120. You will, you also make an earrings, which cost $50 to produce. If you use the same rate, that means that you will 
you know, the customer will pay $60 is because you are using the same 20% markup. So, however, you analyze the competition and you notice that the earring is costing, you know, $150 is in, the, in, in most of the stores. And, um, you know, and that those with um, beautiful decoration like yours are scarce. So in this situation, you're looking at what can the market provide? What, you know, how much is the market willing to pay? So when you're looking at market valuation, you look at how much the customer is willing to pay and not actually the features of your products and services. We all know that um, we can have the same product sold at different prices in different markets. So if your market is willing to pay for more because some people will actually uh, you know, uh, you know, interpret low cost pricing to be uh, you know, low value product. So you need to be careful, understand the market and what the market offers is what you try to peg your price. So meaning instead of selling your product at $60, you should sell it at $150 because that is the market valuation for that product or service. Another example. So a milk store is uh, more expensive than the other, but it is located on the way to your client's home. The customer may prefer to pay a bit more for convenience and um, he or she is just paying, you know, he or she is not just paying for the milk, but also the campaign for the convenience to as well. So you need to understand that, you know, <clears throat> price difference may occur either because of the market that you are selling the product or the services that you are offering. If you are doing home delivery, you may actually charge for more because of the um, additional services that you have. And because the you know, customer is actually um, having, um, you know, is actually having value for the service that you're offering, they may be willing to pay for an additional price. So, you know, a tip here, if in, in, the, in, in the valuation variant, you check, you know, the market potential as described above, and calculate the maximum price that the customer is willing, you know, that the customer can pay. Fifty dollars for the milk may be okay, but if they are charging three times more in the same market, that may not, you know, that you it may be difficult for you to find a buyer. So, you know, if the products are charged, you know, are, you know, are fifty dollars, and the market is you know, ac you know, accepted that amount to be um, you know, a reasonable pricing. If you charge three times more, that's not reasonable. So the issue is, look, you know, the market will actually determine the pricing in, in, in most cases. So you need to be able to, um, you know, look at, um, you know, your customer segment and be able to know what prices they are, uh, you know, willing to pay. So the other thing is, you know, you need to um, know your customers. Like we discussed earlier, you know, if your customers are willing to pay, you know, uh, for an additional price, if you are, let's take for instance, if you are looking at the high-end clients and the high-end client most of the time are willing to pay premium, either because of comfort or because of uh, prestige, they may be willing to pay for more. So the if you understand your customer, then you'll be able to um, you know, charge prices accordingly. So break-even sales. So break-even sales is talking about um, the number, you know, the number of units that you need to produce before you actually, um, you know, before this, you know, the um, the cost and the sales, you know, are, are, are at par. So how much units do you need to produce? So the equation for break-even sales is the fixed cost divided by 
the selling price per unit minus variable cost per unit. So if you know the fixed cost, you will actually say, you know, put the fixed cost divided by the selling price minus the cost price or selling price minus the variable cost. Then the net effect of it is what you divide by the fixed cost. And that is what gives you the break even sales quantity. So for you to be able to know how much products or how much units that you need to make profit, you need to calculate the break even sales. So I hope you are calculating your break even sales now. So break even point is the quantity you need to sell to generate enough income, you know, to cover your total cost. So I want us to reflect on this. How can I diversify my revenue? How can you change your revenue streams from um, what you're actually um, you know, doing now? So you can diversify your revenue by you know, creating you know, new products. And that will, that will actually mean that you need to innovate to be able to um, change the, you know, your various revenue. Or you may add some services to be able to um, you know, charge, you know, service that you can actually charge for to be able to um, you know, uh, take um, advantage of um, you know, diversification. So, and um, you may actually you know, you know, um, diversify a new product range to as well. So those, all those are possible. Am I able to produce as many goods as I plan? So this is a question that goes to you. Will you be, are you able to produce more goods than you plan? And if yes, it is good, but then, do you have a market for it? Am I able to provide services as I plan? If you're able to provide the service as you plan, it is good. If you are able to you know, do more, that is very good. But if you, are, if you are not able to do more and you know, there is competition in the area, that means that you need to be able, you need to um, actually, you know, you know, uh, you know, add to your gym or beef your gym. Otherwise, you know, competition will be, you know, um, competitors will actually come and take over. Do I have the right budget for my products, for my, you know, for my production? So sometimes you may be um, producing, however, the cost that you are producing in may be very high. So you need to actually, um, you know, look at your, you know, your production cost and, um, look at you know, various um, inputs in the production and be able to decide whether or not this production is high. Where it is high, you think about how do I reduce my production cost. So we are looking at budgeting now, and um, we all know that budgeting, you know, a budget is an estimate you know, over a period of time, or um, a budget is a plan over a period of time. So when you are doing your budget, you know, for your various, um, you know, startups, you know, you need to look at it from, you know, various components. One is your sales, the total sales that you get in a month or the total sales that you get in a week, you know, compared to the cost of sales, that is the direct cost attributed to the cost, like we have done, you know, earlier, it also, so that you'll be able to get your gross profit. Now, from your gross profit now, you come to your, you know, your, your fixed costs, you know, salaries, administrative costs. You also have, um, you know, operational costs. Subtract it from the um, from the gross profit, and you'll be able to get your, you know, profit before tax. And um, you know, remove interest, remove taxation. Sorry, and when you remove taxes, you get profit after tax. So um, when you have that, for you to plan for twelve months multiply each of these by 12 and you get your month, you know, annual figures. When you get your annual figures, then at the end of the 12 months, you input your, you know, your sales, actual cost of sales, the actual of it, so that you'll be able to compare sale, you know, actual minus budget, then you'll be able to get your variance or if you like, call it difference between the two of them. So um, a positive variance is showing that your business is doing well. A negative variance is showing that your business is struggling. Yeah. So we, let's move. So we go to um, 
you know, you know, before you go to your workbook to um, identify potential source of income, um, I wish to um, state that when you say potential source of income, meaning that your business have the capacity to you know, generate this type of income, most probably now you are not generating that. Yeah, you have to be mindful of that. So if at all you are now um, you know, having your juice processing plant and maybe in the juice processing plant, you are only doing mango juice. Now, because you are doing mango juice, that means that you may be able to do orange juice, which is a potential source of income. You know, and if you are able to do, you know, orange juice, that means that you may have the skills to do mango jam and orange jam, you know, and you, you need to also, you need to also consider that whether or not you have those potential. So those, all of those now become your potential sources of income, even though you are not, um, you know, getting them now, but then you have the capacity and the skills to get that. You also look at, you know, when it comes to the skills, Skills will include, uh, you know, sorry, the services. The services may include, you know, uh, delivery fees. So maybe some of your customers want you to deliver it to them. So um, that means that you need to add a particular percentage for delivery, which becomes a potential source. So when it comes to, um, you know, services, those that do service, let's say from those that are doing IT services, most of them, you know, some of them do, um, do website development <clears throat> and those that do website development you know may also have skills to do um you know mobile app or even mobile games you you know you may have the skills to do all those things so but then you do not you know introduce them all of them are potential sources of income that you have so and um, some too as well that are doing you know that also have skills in graphic design. So that becomes a potential source of income. So you look at all these potential sources of income, those are the ones that you consider when you are um, you know, you know, doing this. <laughs> so can I diversify my revenues? Yes. So when it comes to diversification, you need to understand that um, to diversify means that you want to reduce your risk. So for you to reduce your risk, you need to diversify your revenues in a different segment. If you are doing IT and you want to, you know, you want to diversify, you invest in how do you call it in in a, in a restaurant. Those two are not very related. You know, when the IT business may be going down, that may be the time that um, the um, the you know, you know the um, you know the food business may be going up. So diversification is talking about you being able to you know invest or start a business in another sector. So that is important for you to know. So you think about what other sector can I actually invest in, or what other sector can I actually you know you know exploit. That is important. So how who else can I? How else can I earn money? How can you earn money? You can earn money by diversification of your products. That's one. You can also add, you know, earn money by um, by innovation. You know, innovate your products, you know, or services, and be able to generate more money. Yeah. So, <clears throat> which other method could um, bring additional income to me? So, you know, in thinking about methods that can bring additional income to you, is I would advise that you assess yourself as a business person. Look at your skill set. How utilized are you already? You need to assess all those things. The next thing that you need to do now is, you know, look at um, what is available in the market, you know, for your product and service. If at all, your computers are providing, you know, other product range or other services that you are not providing, you should consider bringing them in. However, you should also, you know, uh, work closely with your, um, you know, with your clientele or your customers to be able to see whether or not they actually, um, you know, you know, um, you know, look forward to those products or they will actually patronize those products or services. Yeah, so you can go to the workbook now and, um, you know, um, look at the various, you know, areas that we just looked at, yeah. So what is bookkeeping? 
Bookkeeping is the art of collecting, recording, storing, and retrieving financial information. So collect information using um, invoices, receipts, you know, and um, you know, uh, deposit slips. You know, all these are sources of um, collecting information. You record using, um, you know, uh, QuickBooks. You record using Afri Jula. You record using all these are sources of recording. You store by filing them. You know, and for you to retrieve them, you need to be able to identify when you are actually filing. You need to identify, do identification as to this, you know, um, invoice relates to this or this um, payment budget relates to this. So when it comes to collection, there are different, um, you know, you know, documents that you can use, uh, you know, as your source documents. So your source document may in include sales order, purchase order. Quotation from um, you know, quotation to your to your clients. You have invoices, you have um, you know, receipts. You have checks. You know, um, you need credit notes. You have debit notes. You have um, deposit slips. You have um, you know, petty cash voucher. You have payment voucher. You have a journal voucher. You have you know, good received notes. You have bank statements. All of these are sources that you can use to be able to do your recording in your in your um, in your books of accounts. So for you to do um, you know for you to record, you need um, you know sales day book you know that is for sales, you know, sales that are made on credit if you have any, purchase day book for purchases that are made on credit, petty cash for small payments. You have um, cash book for um, you know cash. And check transactions. You have, um, you know, sales return day book for goods that are returned on credit. Purchase return day book that are, you know, for goods that are returned, that are bought and returned on credit. So you also have general journal. What our advice is, um, most of you may not have that sophisticated systems yet to be able to do all this recording. If you are doing the recording manually. I strongly advise that you do your, you know, your cast book religiously. Do your cast book very, very well. That will actually, you know, help reduce the, um, you know, <clears throat> you know, the difficulties, you know, in in your in your in your recording. If you need, have an accountant that is coming to assist you, recording devices. So the recording devices that um, you know, for manual systems, you can use choir books or pre-printed ledgers that you can buy from the, you know, from the shops. You also have um, you know, semi-automated. You can use Excel. You can decide Excel templates for you, and you can use it for your recording. You know, but then if you need an automated system, you need to um, you know, you know, uh, get um, the Afrijula app or the Afrijula um, you know accounting software get QuickBooks, get, um, you know, Bookkeeper app, you know, any of these three apps can actually help solve your problem. So what I'll advise you to do is, you can just pause and uh, take note of these ones. And later you can actually, you know, look at Afrijula, look at QuickBooks, and also look at Bookkeeper app on Google. Search them on Google and try to um, see which of them you actually need now. I believe it is very important for you to start using, you know, automated systems because the minister just mentioned that um, you have, you know, they will require, you know, businesses that earn more than five million dollars to be audited. You don't know whether or not this year or next year your business will be in that range. So it is best for you to start um, using, um, you know, accounting softwares to save you in the future. So you, you know, um, look at, um, you know, example of, um, you know, a, a cash book. So in a, in a cash book, you have the date, you have the description, you have the bank or cash, you know, and that is for the deposit side. When you, that is for the incoming side. For the expenditure side, you also have date, description, bank, or cash. So what it is, you know, what is important for you to do is you need to be able to um, 
make sure that this cash book, if you have one, make sure that it is done regularly and always try to get bank statements to check whether or not you know, your cash book is complete. Sound financial management. It is important for every business to um, keep their books up to date. Update your books regularly. So if you do not have all the books of account, like I mentioned, you should make sure that your cash book is maintained and religiously you know, updated. That is important. So keep all invoices and give them tax, identify them, give them numbers if there's any, if there's need, and also categorize them. So, you know, stationary invoices should be different from, you know, sales invoices, and then should be different from you know, raw material invoices. So you need to be able to categorize them. So you have um, write down all your expenditures, all that you spend, you need to write. All that you um, have as income, you also need to write them down. So that was why I was insisting that you should maintain a cash book if you do not have the capacity to maintain other um, you know, books of accounts. Summarize all your income and expenditures on a monthly basis. Compare your income and expenditures. Make sure you summarize all of them. If you have income of 40,000 this month and, and an expenditure of 30,000 this month, that means you have a profit of 10,000. So you need to you know, do that comparison every month so that you also know which month you perform better, especially for those of you that are doing seasonal, um, you know, seasonal sales. So you'll be able to know which season or which period you, you have more sales or so. This will actually help you in future planning. Avoid as much as possible on predicted costs, on planned costs, emotional spending, and all spending should be planned monthly. So make sure that what you budget is what you actually spend. So some of you, you know, you know that um, you know like spending on weddings or like spending on gentes or you know naming ceremonies or so. You should actually make sure that if you are, if you want to, you know, be be doing that. Make sure that it is part of your plan expenditures. Otherwise, do not use business you know, funds to patronize non-business expenses. Yeah? So that is fine. Before incurring any cost, consider you know, you know, priority and also whether, whether it is necessary. It is important. So you need to consider whether or not what I am spending on is it in line with um, my business model? Is it part of my business plan? It is part of um, what um, you know, I actually want for my business? Or oh, is it priority for my business? Is it necessary? If it is a no, that means that you should not spend on it. Yeah? So every month, save a particular percentage of your revenue. It is important. That um, you know, if you are making a lot of you know business, if you are making um, sale or you are making profit, it is important that um, each month, if it is a five percent or ten percent of you know your profit, save it. You never know when you will need this money. Save it and let it be safe for future and unforeseen circumstances. You know, um, you must know that um, eighty percent of startups fail. And most of them fail because they are cash trapped. You should not allow yourself to be one. Okay. So when revenues are high, when you have a lot of profit, when you have you know a lot of um, you know money, endeavor to have an investment plan. Invest for the future. Plan what do you need to expand in your business. If you don't need to expand in your business, then do I need to you know, invest in properties so that you know, um, you know, it will be able to um, you know, help me in the future? But then focus it first on what do I need to do to scale my business? So focus your investment plan on scaling your business. You know, it can be monthly or it can be annual plans. Okay, by next year, I should be able to do that. I don't, you know, yeah, you know, in three years time, in five years time. So you need to have your investment plan. The next one is, you need to hire a professional and trustworthy accountant if you can afford it. If you cannot afford it, try to get the service 
of someone that understand this, that will guide you through, because it is important for every business to um, be financially savvy. Because you know you have competition now, and you have um, a lot of um, you know people that are investing in the same business as you. So for you to survive competition, for you to survive you know a lot of um, you know uh, these um, challenges, you need you know a business advisor, preferably an accountant, to guide you through. So. Action changes things. You've heard most of what we've discussed. What I'm urging you to do is to take action and take action now. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you.